so I work for Digit Games for a, a game company that creates uh, educational games as well as casual mobile games. And what I thought I would do is just quickly run through a, a more condensed version of what I presented at DevLearn to explain mm -hmm. sort of uh, what we, uh, how we got involved with XAPI and what we've done. Um, so basically, we uh, we were in a situation here where we were looking at our own learning analytics, especially associated with our K-12 learning games, and saw both the uh, marketplace for K-12 games and also our own games internally as a lot of islands of data. Um, it was a problem and it was only getting worse, so we decided it was time to look for a solution. Uh, these were generally what we sort of mapped out as requirements um, to design a new learning analytics platform. And it sort of evolved into a much deeper uh, research project uh, involving XAPI. So uh, what we initially did internally here is we looked at XAPI as a new standard. I liked what it was. Um, my background's software, I'm not a learning professional. Um, and uh, there were a lot of attributes about it that I thought were very positive, and I thought it was definitely going to be the wind for the future um, with respect to being able to collect data. Mm -hmm. So what I had my team do was basically uh, take one of our JavaScript HTML5 games and do a very quick and dirty prototype based on some of the existing libraries that were out there. Uh, we stood up a learning locker um, instance uh, quickly and uh, got to work on making it actually work. So it worked, but it wasn't perfect and it wasn't really gonna address what we thought we needed for the market and, and to a certain degree here in turn. Um, we all that it was Wild Wild West. Um, you know, it's great to have the specification, but without a little more structure associated with how you go about these things and how we may want to collect contextual data, et cetera, we realized that uh, this could get a little um, cumbersome. So to give you a timeline of sort of where we went, we had that early research we did, and then we approached the National Science Foundation and said, we thought this would be a great standard for the K-12 community, both for games and apps. Um, using XAPI, and they agreed. So they gave us uh, an SBIR research grant to actually delve into this and uh, publish our research associated with that. We then published it open source in 2017 and actually formally um, uh, created the community uh, practice in 2018. Um, Andy, who I think is still online, was very helpful in getting us through those final steps. Mm -hmm. uh, the research goals that we had um, for the community associated with our NSF work was that it needed to be interoperable. We needed uh, a standard that was going to be transparent. We need to be able to normalize data and need to be simple to use and flexible, which is most of what XAPI provides. So that was a good thing. Um, we also, as part of our research, did went out to the network. We went out to the all the different potential users. Uh, here's an example of K-12 administrators asking them, you know, is game-based learning um, data essential to game-based learning? And 94% felt it was going to be incredibly important for adoption at scale. And uh, from the standpoint of game developers, they said, yes, standardization is definitely going to be important for the future. Um, there's a lot of problems in this marketplace, uh, which means that uh, trying to get everybody on board with this will probably take some time. Um, but they, they do understand why it would be important. So this is the general architecture we outlined for um, implementing XAPI. Uh, using the um, what we were going to eventually create as the GBL XAPI profile. I'll get a little more into this, but we basically took a variety of different games. We created a, a Unity API using the C-sharp uh, libraries that existed, uh, had data recording to the learning record store, and then going off to a much more robust DI tool where we did more further analysis. 
Um, you're all familiar with this, so I'm not going to go through this, but I wanted to focus on the tail end here and where we did most of our work. There was a lot that we could leverage already with the XAPI profiles. We didn't have to do a lot of modifications. Uh, we made some requests for some additional things to be put in the profile for the serious games profile. Uh, but other than that, it was fairly minor other than publishing our own profile and then publishing online a deep contextual um, vocabulary associated with K-12 data. Um, and you can see here, what we did is basically created an online URI reference for using contextual metadata in XAPI statements relevant to K-12. How we got there uh, was basically creating these six core vocabulary types, domain, subdomain, focus, skills, topics, and action. Uh, these were not something that we sort of created ourselves. What we did is we actually went out to four of the biggest K-12 educational standards out there, Common Core, mm -hmm. Next Generation Science Standards, and the Social Studies C3 framework. And what we did is we tried to find common elements associated with all of those so that we could bring them all into a common structure. The idea being get away from a U.S. specific vocabulary and allow uh, everyone to have a universal vocabulary um, and later we ended up having to create some additional vocabulary URIs for these specific standards because people in the U.S. were going to want it. Um, but this was to create a common universal uh, contextual vocabulary that could be used in XAPI statements. So here's an example of what we did with the domain ex extension. You can probably see some of these and, and uh, remember some of these things, geometry, counting and cardinality. These are all things that are referenced in one of those um, standards somewhere along the way. Um, and these are common, whether you're in the US or Canada or India, um, somewhere along the way, this is gonna be taught. So right now we created 2,415 50 permanent URIs for learning activity context and published it on gblxapi.org. Um, and they are related to the GBLXAPI profile by structure with these new extensions that were added into the, uh, for the profile. Um, here's an example of an XAPI statement, obviously not in the JSON format, um, of how you might have multiple different things and how we're using our resolvable permanent URIs in our context catalog, but also using all of the XAPI structure as well. So again, our big focus was that we thought XAPI was very good with what we already had in the profiles and what we could use there. What it was missing was the contextual metadata aspect. And we realized that that probably needed to sit outside but for the K-12 community to really adopt something like this, we were going to have to give them something with more structure. Our current flow, as I referenced before, is basically uh, games or apps uh, go to Learning Locker. Uh, we create organizations and stores within there, and then we schedule a pull for that to Data Cubes in our BI tool, which is uh, SciSense. I'll show you in a sec. We also created a Unity 3D API so that anyone who's using the Unity uh, API, whether it's for higher ed, K-12, any application simulations in the military, et cetera, um, they could use this uh, API, which is built upon the uh, Tin Can C Sharp libraries. Uh, we created a GBLX API um, vocabulary in there. Uh, to support all of our catalog items as well as a user vocabulary and then there's the uh, custom libraries and that is free and available to anybody who wants to use it. Um, we uh, process the XAPI JSON data from the Mongo database and this is sort of how it ends up um, on the BI side. Um, we use a Simba connector via ODBC that comes with SciSense um, to get this data and normalize it into these flattened tables. Um, everybody's sort of seeing the reports. We can create a lot of different reports in SciSense. Um, here's an example of getting into that contextual learning experiences. So now that we have a, a vocabulary that is consistent across all of the games and apps, 
we can search for a player across multiple games if we wanted for an item like historical sources and evidence or calculation and computation and, and start to delve into a deeper analysis on that if we wanted to. Ultimately, one of our things that we said to the NSF is that we could use XAPI as sort of the uh, electronic medical record um, sort of analogy um, for the K-12 community. Um, if we have some structure associated with this, um, all apps uh, could be, re you could remove the PII data and then actually get the uh, data into a common data store that could be used by research, uh, researchers. Hey, um, um, so, yep. sorry, um, I, I don't quite understand the, yeah, the previous page. Okay. Can, can you explain? Yeah, so this is just a chart. Um, that we pulled from a variety of different uh, users that are on the left-hand side. Um, and what we did is rather than just pulling verbs or um, object activities, this is actually pulling um, from the skills domain um, uh, extension, what, what they actually did associated with skills in this game. So for example, Marcos here had quite a bit of activity doing patterns and relationship and had quite a bit of activity. These are numbers of statements in calculation and computation, but did very little on historical sources and evidence. And that was probably relative to the game. But what you can see over here is someone who named themselves Google um, didn't go into historical sources and evidence. And if it's, if I recall by looking back at this game, it means that they never read any of the, um, reading material in the game oh, okay. and therefore they have no skills. So those are three categories of activities? Yes. Uh, and the uh, horizontal direction are the statement counts? Yes, yes. Okay, got it. Sorry. I'm trying That's to go through this quickly so I can answer as many questions as possible. <laughs> um, and then we also, and I can show you this right now if you want, uh, what's interesting is SciSense was experimenting with using an AI bot and we found that we can actually pull our reports using Microsoft Teams, Skype, or Amazon Alexa. Um, and I don't know, let me just see. Uh, can you guys see the Skype screen? Or not? Oh, uh, what? No. Yeah. Do you see the Skype screen? No. We see this dashboard chart. Dashboard, okay. dashboard in which? Okay. Okay, all right, then um, it's probably because when I was sharing, I just shared this specific PowerPoint. So I'll come back to that later. Um, but this was interesting. And one of the reasons we found this interesting is initially we were kind of looking at this for educators and saying, we'd like to provide them a Twitter feed so that they could actually see what was going on when students were using apps and games and oh. sort of look at that coming through, right? Um, and then we heard from them that they were already kind of overwhelmed with data and they probably wouldn't need that right now. Um, so then we explored looking at things like this where they might be able to get snapshots of data in a variety of other different ways too. Um, tools that they may be using internally such as Skype. Um, and this actually does some other analysis other than just spinning up the reports if you want to pull that. Um, one of the other things that we found that uh, as a game organization, we decided to use XAPI for all of our games. So whether it's educational or casual um, mobile games, such as our Rotera game that we're going to launch in January, we actually use that for game testing. Um, and we found that it was fairly easy to do once we had already set up this structure rather than using other tools. Um, one of the problems we realized in implementing XAPI in games is to be a little careful about what you want to track. Um, if all of you are familiar with match three games, um, such as Candy Crush, we had a game called Silk Road that we implemented XAPI in and all of a sudden we had 1.4 million uh, statements mm -hmm. because we were tracking things like every time one of these coins would uh, you know, change its perspective into a spinning horizontal or a spinning vertical. So we were collecting way too much data. I think uh, it's a lesson learned to sort of look at how you're doing data management, um, but I thought I'd just share that. So 
from the standpoint of implementation, it can be done fairly quickly. I say two weeks, um, depending upon where people are with their understanding X API. But right now, I just, you know, put um, our Unity API and our process um, into some X API games that were created in the recent cohort. And essentially, I did that within a day. Um, it's really that quick to actually implement it with the Unity API. And then um, these were somewhat learning games, so they leveraged some of our contextual data, but mainly just existing X API profiles. And again, this is free to anybody that wants to use it for Unity. Um, NSF was very uh, excited about this. They did not give us a phase two SBIR because they didn't see a market um, opportunity for it, but they were, they thought the research was very good and the approach was very good. Um, and that's sort of a summary on that. Um, let me, uh, let me see if I can, I'm gonna share a different screen here. Mm -hmm. So, um, Stora, uh, yeah. I have a question. Uh, who are your target audience? Um, uh, because you have the API, so I guess you could help learning game developers to add learning analytics with this API, right? Yeah, basically, I mean, the Unity one definitely helps for anybody that is using Unity and then our goal was uh, sort of twofold. One was, well, we had our own internal goal. But secondly, was to um, organize a structure so that we could collect data like I'm showing here um, that's all available online here in our catalog search. So you can go in here and you can actually pick, you know, focus, which is one of the extensions, and then actually see all the elements that are actually in here click on it and you can see what this is this is all about within this. And then the other thing that we um, wanted to do too was also um, be able to show people games and apps that actually were supporting XAPI in the standard. So you can actually put this in here and actually um, depending upon how you go about it, you can actually um, within here you can search and see what's uh, what contextual activity i haven't built this out completely um, but the idea was that if you wanted to search for a game or an app using uh, counting and cardinality you could actually come here and find a game uh, that has that in it and that would help some of the issues with people finding good educational games as well um, so if there are games that built by Unity, it's already existing games. They can yep. add they can use the API? Yep, yep. Okay. they can use the API. It's very simple to, to put into place. The other thing that we do, um, I'm gonna stop the share here and find this other thing, is to help people getting started we also created this uh, free template that we share. Mm -hmm. And basically the idea here was to tell people, look, if you're gonna do this, you need to sort of get organized. So if you know what your learning outcomes are, et cetera, get your stuff organized here, come up with what your URI methodology and organization should be associated with your applications and to a certain degree specific to also what you're doing as a corporation. Um, and get that organized sort of in your setup here and then begin to list your events and what we did here in the spreadsheet is you know for example here let's just say launch game is that we have it so that you can from these drop downs pick the most common verbs that we were using you can augment this um, to sort of a designer can act, a learning designer can actually organize this so that when a developer is going to implement it they can actually see this. And what I haven't shown you in the, in the Unity API is that we've also set this up so that we, you can add things to your own user vocabulary. Uh, we also include all of these items that we already have put here in our core vocabulary. And we run a script um, off the Excel sheet 
and basically what that allows is so that when you're entering information in the Unity engine, um, it will actually pull from a JSON file that's then been created. So you don't have to enter all of the data. If you just type in menu, it's going to pull this data without you having to get all of that in. So that's part of your uh, Unity API? Yes, that's part of the Unity API. So, um, so I'll just uh, take questions. I mean, our goal is to basically, we believe this is, uh, is a good standard for collecting uh, baseline data for K-12. We think XAPI was definitely the way to go. Um, and we're championing this and we've created the community with a, uh, we allow people to uh, download that uh, Unity API for free and any other information there, as well as uh, sandbox test on our Learning Locker installation, as well as provide them access to the SciSense tool um, to go around and experiment on things as well. So happy to take some questions or any thoughts on this? I realize there's some yep. other standards out there and I can answer as to why we went this route and not, not another. So Stuart, I have two questions. This is Michael. Sure. Um, one has to do with that issue about what I sort of have historically referred to as the dribble files of okay. uh, tons of data coming in. And I mean, how do you, this has been a thread of conversation in this group, and that is how do you, do, do you recommend creating some sort of learning model and using that to maybe hone the, the data that you're actually collecting to inform the learning process or to create a picture rather than just inundating yourself with all potential data? Yeah, so I think it's, it's, it's kind of like how you want to, obviously you can get a ton of data and you need to have a data management plan and, and try to understand where you can go from here. So I look at it in a variety of, I also look at this as phases. So when we are collecting data during testing, I usually collect more. Mm -hmm. When we, when we get to beta, I even add more. And then when we go to production, I keep it at that level for about a month and then I trim it back. Based, um, on. based on the fact that I only needed to see that data for to do certain validations on what my assumptions were. Mm. And then really it doesn't have a lot of other relevance. Um, but, and I've captured enough of a data set that I need. So is that, um, is that based Stuart on an emerging model of what best characterizes the learner's progress or predictors of learner success or things that inform the activities um, moving ahead? What, what is the model that you're using to then, to then trim that back? So um, the models ha are sort of twofold and they're, they involve uh, learning and non-learning activities. Typically what we find is that we remove what, and, and realistically, these can all be called learning activities, but we try to segment it. And what we try to do is with non-learning activities, things like, um, I'm trying to think of an example of that right now. Um, like for example, I might be running around in a game and I may get, uh, I may be picking up some coins. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. We track that type of data. And then at some point I don't track it anymore. Um, I could, if, if I'm worried about my data um, getting too big, kind of like I showed you in that Silk Road example. Mm -hmm. um, but, and it really doesn't impact what I need to share with the educator, the administrator, or someone else. But interestingly enough, there's other non-learning data, such as just how many times it got launched and those types of things that administrators actually found more important in reporting Sure. than the learning data. And it was because they said, we don't have good data today that actually tells us if they're actually using it. Um, so it has to blend those approaches. I don't know if that helps you. And I, I, well, I do believe that there is, a, there is a place for a model. Like what we've tried to do even yeah. here in, in the SciSense thing is try to create it so that I can actually take a dashboard like this 
and copy it to a, and use a different data cube that's coming from Learning Locker, and it could be the same report. So I think if you look at reports as sort of the basis for um, what the outcomes are that you want to track to, for the basis for your model and start to create some standard reports, which is what we wanted to do more of in our second phase of research with NSF. And I'd be happy to work with somebody who, who wants to, you know, build upon this. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there's definitely work that can be done there. And I think the K-12 community needs, needs a good solid model or a good set of standard reports that gives them the data they want. Let me ask one other question. I know we're going to run out of time here, but um, uh, so you chose to show us mathematics and having built many of these, what I've called intermediaries, um, mm -hmm. you know, math piece of cake. How do you handle social science? Okay, so that's our expertise, actually. And that's one oh, good. reason that we actually looked at it. Most of our games are actually social studies. Good. So um, it's a little more challenging, but there is a whole... Um, if you're not familiar with the standard, there's the C3 standard. Yep. Um, and it um, provided us um, a good basis for, hang on, I can't get over there. Um, a good basis for sort of building upon that. So for, there are ch some challenges though. There are things like, for example, we were, we use experienced a lot as a verb mm -hmm. instead of read mm -hmm. because unless we're going to track time or have some other validation point we don't know if they actually read it yeah um so that's you know you get into uh, and the other thing that we found um even on the math side that we really uh liked with what we were doing with xapi is the transparency so as you know you know, on a lot of math programs, um, things may be generated uh, dynamically. Um, so the same user is not getting the same question. Well, how are, if you're gonna go deeper into the analysis, then, you know, the nice thing is, is if you can capture the pattern in the results, then you know the specific question that that individual was being presented. Um, at the end, even at that time, like if the game changed a year later, you would be able to see whether it's reading data or something else that actually changed. Um, well, I, I, I can answer more of that offline and I can thanks. actually sh share uh, data with you if you want to see sort of how we collect data for social studies. Great. Thanks, Stuart. Yep. This, is, uh, this is Patrick. Uh, I got to drop off in just a couple of minutes, but um, at a high level, uh, we were just kind of getting involved in collecting uh, data from a Jeopardy game. Um, yep. Do you have any re uh, like high level recommendations on what you would be collecting on some kind of interaction like that? Uh, yeah, I mean, if you uh, let's let's take a look back here. Um, I can and I can share an example of. We have an example on the GBLX API site of a, of a simple game. Um, but I can show you here that, you know, if you look at this, we would say, is there a difficulty level associated with Jeopardy within the game? Mm -hmm. I'd want to track that because I'd want to know what they're actually doing associated with that. If there are instructions, capture whether they actually read the instructions or not. Um, and then it's just basically uh, questions and basically, you know, they answer the question, did they attempt it? Did they answer it correctly, complete it? Um, I'm trying to think of other things associated with uh, Jeopardy off the top of my head. Um, but it actually gets fairly simple in my view with that type of game because the, the mechanic is, is the same. Um, there's not a lot of variation in it, which is fairly similar to this game example that I'm showing here. There are other things that we track as well, whether people are using music, they have music on, sound on, off, whatever the case may be. Um, and from the standpoint of progress, um, I would definitely suggest if you haven't looked at the Serious Games pro profile, definitely look at the uh, things in there. I do. Um, Proctor, I'm just trying to update that Proctor. That was the Serious Games profile you said? Yeah. And I can, you know, if you want to send me a note, I can um, share this spreadsheet with you as well. And you can sort of get an idea. I can 
I can show you another game or just just email me and I can um, you will be. I can <laughs> so just I'm happy to tell you what I'm we so were sorry this is the worst thing oh thank you so much appreciate it thank yep. you <laughs> yeah. um, I will fix that yeah. thanks guys I gotta drop off I'll talk to you guys later thank you okay bye so um store yeah what what are those insights that uh, you found that SAPI could Okay. That could what? Inside. Um, no, um, went without a hitch. No issues. In fact, I didn't get called. During... Well, I didn't. I didn't find any. Okay. Um, well, first of all, it addressed. It solved the problem that we had, and um, well, we've learned some things along the way. The biggest thing that we learned was uh, a lack of having a contextual vocabulary associated with the profiles specific to a domain like K-12 was going to be problematic because then we would have, we would not have normalized data. So someone would call counting in cardinality something else. Mm -hmm. uh, they may not name it the same way they, and without a specific URI, which is the whole fundamental basis for the, the spec, um, then, then we would be back to where we had started from the standpoint of a universal approach to collecting data for K-12. Um, so that was probably the biggest thing. Yeah. And the other problem that we, we had was um, that we didn't run into and we sort, sort of still haven't resolved is that, and especially with extensions, when we were pulling data from Learning Locker um, into our BI tool, it ends up with a very long table name. Um, and that is because the table names end up with um, including sort of the URI reference and you run into a Windows file name size issue um, as those start to get built upon because there's the file name size within the Mongo database that then comes in with this long URI name with it and then the SciSense engine wants to add some other names other data to the file name for its own structure and then we run into this you know character issue with Windows. Um, so that's one of the problems we had as, as well. Um, other than that, I mean, I think it's, um, we, we think it can also still dovetail with other s standard efforts that are out there. Um, there's IMS Global, um, and I see, you know, its role and its function and what it does, but it doesn't deal with granular data, and I think this sort of provides that granular data. And it also, quite frankly, for our community, XAPI being open source and being free and, ha you know, the kind of work that we've done here to help with the, the community will allow uh, better adoption. I mean, I am, the IMS standard basically is going to, requires developers to pay money. Um, it's not yeah. necessarily easy to implement. And the reality is, is that with our XAPI, XAPI data, we can feed data to IMS Global, but it's, you know, it's going to be parsed. But a lot of researchers want the core data, and XAPI, we think, is the, is the best solution for that. It's also transparent. Um, you can read it. It's machine readable. Uh, there were just so many things that we, we loved about it. Yeah, and, and um, if you adopt IMS standard, uh, you cannot build a profile by your like by your com, uh, community. Yep. So uh, SAP is much more flexible. It's yep. uh, your own community driven. And um, you also integrate the uh, SciSense and even with AI bot. The AI bot is from SciSense, right? Yes. Yes, that's a tool that they've been using. So um, you, you could work with uh, Unity developers to uh, add on uh, analytics for them. Yep. And, uh, but you, you have current games that already implement all these analytics. So yeah, we uh, use it. Uh, it's, it's in our games right now. It's, as I said, we're using it in our current game that's just about to be in beta and I'll launch in January. And that's a casual commercial game has nothing to do with education or learning. Oh, okay, really? Um, 
So uh, what are those um, analytics that you will provide to the game? Uh, it's a commercial game, so who will look at those, who will use those dashboards? Uh, usually that's just going to be internal within the company. Here's an example I can just Oh, show okay, you. the game company. Yeah, so basically um, I've got this on a filter. I'm going to filter this. Um, but basically, you know, we're just tracking. We just figured if we've got an XAPI, we could use Unity Analytics. We can use other things. We could have used Google. But why if we can do it using the same structure we already know? So this, these these are the types of things that we're collecting data on right now um, mm -hmm. for a casual mobile game. Yeah, I, I saw you build a uh, SAPI uh, supporting system here. So uh, as you said, you are happy to work with um, uh, developers yep. to yeah uh, build more learning analytics, right? Yep. Great. Um, your um, SAPI profiles now are for like virtual world activities. Could I say that? Serious games? Yes, serious games. Mm. And, and how about and, and any K-12 application? Um, K-12? Uh-huh. Are you, are you talking about K-12? Yeah, anything in K-12 could use this as well. They couldn't use the Unity engine if it's built in some other form, but from the standpoint of the GBLX API community and the contextual uh, vocabulary we created to support the GBLX API profile, if you're doing something and using JavaScript to implement X API, you can still use all of that same structure. Mm -hmm. And how about um, a physical, uh, like a museum? Um, if they have um, interactives that are digital, yes, you can collect data that way. Because you talk, about, uh, you talk about you talk about web-based environment. So if you think about the physical world, if it's a web-based, um, like, a, like a, the digital twins concept. Mm -hmm. So they, that's similar. And yeah, and there's a variety. Of, yeah, there's a variety of different ways where you can marriage, uh, as you know, bring XAPI into places like museums where it's not necessarily the digital interface. It can be things like you can give people a device, and you know they collect data as they move through the museum based on what they like, they didn't like, etc. Those types of things, and then that just gets pushed once the device is is retrieved again. Yeah. Um, is there any other AI engines that you have connected? Um, just, um, do you, what do you mean by AI engine? Do you mean tools like uh, Skype or, or Alexa, uh, or do you mean actually other AI, AI bots? Um, I saw you on, on your um, uh, page, one of your presentation page, you have those blocks and one yeah. of them, yeah, it's AI engines. Yeah, so um, the AI bot with uh, SciSense is the only thing that we've done so far. Mm -hmm. um, and that allows us to communicate with the uh, Skype tool, Alexa, and uh, Microsoft Teams to actually pull data. Okay. But as far as, um, any other AI bots? No, we that's something we may have looked at when if we'd done the phase two, but uh, we did not do that. Yeah, that's in future. Okay. Yeah, mm -hmm. someday. Yeah, I really like your work. Well, thanks. Any other questions?
So we can find all the resources on your website, right? Yeah, um, basically I can, uh, you know, it's just uh, gblxapi.org and um, there's, uh, there's a blog in there that talks about the Unity thing. There's a way to sign up. Right now the Unity API is, um, you just fill out a form. We've kept it in beta. It will eventually be on GitHub, but right now we're looking to get feedback and a more controlled method from people. We have people basically all over the um, world that are actually uh, using, uh, looking to use it. We've got people in India, uh, Switzerland, uh, Ghana, um, people down in Brazil, uh, someone over in Japan. So there's been quite a bit of interest in looking at how they could potentially use the, the Unity API without us really promoting it uh, very much. Mm -hmm. Cool. It's a uh, GB or it's API.org. And also because of it's sponsored by NSF, so there are a lot of uh, open source resources we can use. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, yeah, we have a um, we have a paper that's going to be published in the GATT journal. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's it's either this month or next month, um, which will also uh, discuss some of our research. Uh, but yeah, just going to gblxapi.org will keep everybody up to speed on sort of um, what we're updating, what we're releasing, um, more things like we have a. Uh, we have a person who's joined the community that's implementing a music game and uh, we'll be adding to the contextual library, library based on um, that work with them uh, to identify uh, good contextual um, references for music in K-12. Mm -hmm. Stuart, can you just post your contact info? I know I have the general website, but wanted to drop you an email and I didn't see that anywhere. Sure. Um, 